Dr. Xavier Soria, who thank you so much for joining us and for sparing you know some time to share your talk with us. Um, so Dr. Soria is a research assistant, uh, sorry, research scientist, and he's working in the area of image processing and computer vision. Um, his current research focuses on the advancing the fields of the image, edge detection, and thermal image super resolution driven by artificial intelligence. Uh, his contributions have transcended the initial domains and are now being applied in various high level computer vision applications. He is currently serving as an adjunct professor at the National University of Chimborazo, an associate researcher at Yes Paul University, which are both actually located in Ecuador. So thank you so much, Dr. Soria, and we're excited to hear what you have to share. Um, we, this meeting is going to be recorded, and, and definitely we shall also have post some of the information on our, on our IHUB site. Thank you so much, Dr. Sorry. Please feel free to begin. Thank you very much, Josephine. Uh, hello to everyone. Just let me, wait a minute to share my presentation, please. Um, May you tell me tell me if you can see my presentation? Okay. Yes, you can. Thank you. Well, hi everyone again. My name is Javier, and today we are going to talk about about the most uh, amazing world of computer vision, as the uh, computer vision is very extended, uh, has very application also. So I am going just to talk about the low level processing in computer vision and from that low level processing in computer vision there are many tasks also so i'm going to try to present you uh, just edge detection first of all i will introduce about myself just a little bit and um, where i'm from i'm from ecuador i spent uh, four amazing years in spain in barcelona at the autonomous university of barcelona uh, during research in deep learning uh, later on, I come back to Ecuador. Now I'm in the Polytechnic School of Chimborazo. And here is the map of my country. And the point in red is where I am living now. It's like near to the, the Amazon. And this is the small town where I am living right now. And you know, it's here, maybe it's raining three or four times a week. But it's amazing. It's amazing. There is a lot of uh, a lot of green spaces. Well, let's start in our in our agenda. So today we are going to speak about a little bit about the vision. Later we are going to see um, briefly about the human visual pathway. Later we are going to see the low level processing in the machine computer or the robot or vision with a image image sensor later we're going to see about the edge detection the edge detection evolution uh, the edge detection now and uh, the contribution of my team in this area and then uh, what generally the community of researchers does with the edge maps so uh, as you can see uh, now, we uh, we see our marvelous world through our eyes. So more or less, these eyes uh, have a evolu having evolutioning from around 541 million years ago, and now our vision systems so many evolution are built, uh, in billion of years is is this one and as you can see uh, in the right way we can see a dog with a red ball and this information is uh, is captured in light through our eyes then this information this light information is uh, is going to our retina and in the, from the retina uh, using uh, going to the system of the vision, go through the lateral genicular nucleus, then we can see uh, the most of the research in psychology of psychophysics, 
uh, they know as the primary visual cortex. And using this area, we can see the first formation of the the first formation of the natural or or the or the real world scenes. Most of the scientists are mostly this is known as the V1 or or cell one, but the primary visual cortex are cortex text also has uh, different stages and in the primary stages this is there are the some process that perform the image formation for example um, this kind of images so today in the cell we are going to speak about this part but not in the human vision but in in the machine vision so the most of the the models based on deep learning that I am going to present, they're trying to mimic the process what is done uh, mostly in the area of the primary visual system. So uh, more or less, that is the the full uh, human visual pathway. We, we find the, the light information of the scene, then go this information to the retina, the, later in the LGN, B1, later in B2, B4, and IT. And then we can say, we can say that it is a dog with a red ball, for example. So now what does computer vision is do the same thing that we do, for example, the objective, at least the objective of computer vision is this, trying to do, trying to understand the, the, the human visual world through the imaging systems, I mean the imaging sensors. So, for example, if we have these images, this image, we use a convolutional convolutional operators using different layers of CNN or convolutional neural networks. And so the different layers of the convolutional neural networks, we can uh, capture different semantic information. And then in the outcome, in the output, we can find that that is a dog, or if we are working in the image captioning, for example, um, sub, uh, sub field task of computer vision, we can say that this is a dog with a red ball. So uh, we, are, we are going to use the same process uh, of the convolutional neural networks to extract information at information. Well, as, as you can know, uh, we can say that a cat is a cat, a dog is a dog, and maybe <clears throat> Maybe a boy or a girl of three, two years old, they can understand that they are learning. They have learned this, this uh, knowledge, but our computer, as you know, just see numbers. So we have to collect a bunch of images, a, a set of images to teach a computer a learning algorithm that those images are a cat, a dog, or other animals or other things. So that is why we generally in the world of deep learning use supervised learning. And that is why uh, from the last decades ago, the supervised learning have, have uh, helped some many, 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 many tasks in different areas. So as I said, in the, in the low level processing of machine learning, the low level processing of machine learning, we can find different operations like image enhancement, image super resolution, edge detection, or image segmentation. These are, these are the first process of, this, of the downstream tasks. Yeah, for example, uh, I'm work, right now I am working in edge detection and image super resolution. That means is that uh, if we are going to speak about the edge detection, okay, you give me an image like this one, the first one here in my left side, then I need a model. It can be learning algorithm or just a mathematical algorithm 
that have to process different operators. And then we get just an edge map. And this is the edge detection that can detect different, uh, the change of the intensity in the image domain. And another uh, low level image processing is the super resolution. In this task, we, for example, uh, as the input have a low, <clears throat> low resolution image, that's like this one you see here. And we construct a um, learning or non-learning model. And then we enhance this image and make a high high resolution images. So these are the edge detection and super resolution and the, the work where I am, uh, the task where I am working on. But mostly I have working in edge detection and that is the, the, the task I am going to present here. So uh, this is the edge detection. As I say, uh, edge detection is the operation, is the primary operation that we, uh, need to detect changes in the image intensity. Uh, the, the changes can be from, from different uh, kind of different kind of characteristics of feature like uh, images, I mean like colors, saturations, and so on. And so but S detection is not new as many of you know. It started in the 1960s. Maybe in the same decade, the computer vision started also. So one of the first edge detector algorithm is the Sobel algorithm that is still used in nowadays. And maybe in many, many applications they use, they are using it yet because this process is very fast and very efficient for the edge computing or in the internet of pink uh, technologies. Later, uh, trying to improve the Sobel edge detector, the edge detector ha has been published in the 1980s. And this edge detector was a set of process that used this uh, similar kernel that filtered the edge and non edge. And then it was processed later with another operation like non maximum suppression and other operations. Later, uh, they have presented people in this years presented new 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 tasks like uh, based on Gabor functions, Gaussian functions, or Laplace functions, and uh, many other edge detectors. And in the twenties, just in the first year of the uh, of the century, a new researchers started using machine learning classical techniques like decision tree or or linear regression. So, but in, in this century, it started with the machine learning in the in the agitation data set. Yeah, because in 20, in 20, 2000, 2003, the first data set and color images have been presented and we are using still this data set. <clears throat> Sorry. But, one of the big advantages comes in 2015 with a edge detector based on the convolutional neural networks. So this, this model has been one of the most important in the last year because most of the edge detectors presented from 20, uh, 2015 are based on CNN or are based on on deep learning, but following the same approach as HEAD presented there. As you can see uh, from the 2020s, uh, we can, we, 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 we have used the, the, the BBCN, for example, that, that one is one of the best uh, algorithms that present uh, great accuracy. Later, we presented Dixinet, um, and later, is presented PDNet, after or UAEV, for example. So, the, all these models uh, are using deep learning, and uh, basically, we are 
approaching big results based on the data sets, based on the classical data set and the new data set usage uh, presented in the last years. So what we can say that now the edge detection, for example, is that is that uh, edge detections right now are convolutional neural networks, are deep convolutional neural networks. For example, the one presented in this year in the CBPR, one of the premier conference in computer vision. So, for example, this uh, deep CNN is is composed by one decoder and two. Uh, I mean one encoder and two decoder later these results from the two decoder are fused to present the final result. But they are huge and we cannot uh, shine in a simple computer or in a in a simple edge devices. And last year, as the transformer models are used in many tasks of computer vision since since nineteen since twenty nineteen. So, uh, edge detection has been used also transformer models. So, these transformer models, as you can see, uh, was presented in one of the premier conferences. Also, yes, widely known. But this model is is very uh, is very heavy, and this kind of new proposal that they are the state of the art, but. They, they helped me to ask these questions. For example, if we do a classification problem, I, a given image, if, if I want to see if a given image has a, is a dog or a cat, just use a learning algorithm. And with this learning algorithm, I can say at the end that this is a dog or a cat. But if we work with the edge detection, we don't have a result. We just have an edge map that is not a final result. That edge map is used for another downstream task or other task that is needed uh, in any area in you are working on. So why we are going to use a heavy networks, heavy models for a preliminary task? That is my question, and that is uh, that is why I am. Uh, we are trying to improve the the model presented lastly. So, uh, right now I am going to present the, the most important edge detector that have been, that have been published in the 2015, 2017, 2019. And the number of parameters that this model has is, is more than, more than 40, 14 million, around, around 20 million of parameters. So um, you cannot process like use a Sobel edge detector or or canny edge detector. You need at least uh, a decent a GPU to train, even to test in a faster way. So as we can see uh, in this year till 2019, the number of parameters are around 20 million parameters. I, I can say that there is not much because, you know, ChatGPT has around 200 billions of parameters. But even so, this is, this is a, a huge, um, a heavy model. But later, even us, uh, proposed an Adixinet, which has 35 million of parameters. That was the most, uh, the most big uh, model in that time. But later, as you can see, after the last year, uh, presented the, the model based, based on transformer model. So this, this transformer model at least need two GPUs. If we want to work with real world applications, maybe work in the, in the fields, we need an edge device. So that is why what we are trying to do is make those uh, networks, those architectures, those learning models smaller. For example, in 2021, the PDNet just proposed an, an model with at almost 1 million of parameters. That was great. But as this model was uh, manually performed the kernels and mixed with the learning 
algorithm kernels, and this was a little hard to process. Even this one. Just to give an example, this feeding it model, even even though this has just around one million of parameters, take more time of training than our Dixiemen. So we still have the problem. <clears throat> That's why I have uh, seen that uh, the last model are turning more complex, and it needs it needs more computational uh, hardware. So um, we started to research the problem. So what is this problem? The problem that we see is that we are using a data set, uh, the, this first presentation, uh, the control detection and hierarchical image segmentation. This is the paper who presented the data set most used in edge detection, BSDS. So we started to analyze all of this image because when the researchers in back 20, 2003, they say that this, this data set was developed for segmentation. So we see the, this problem because segmentation is not the same as edge detection. So uh, right now, many of the researchers are, are training on BSDS and evaluated in the BSDS. So what they are doing is training in a data set that was not prepared or collected for edge detection. The other thing is also that the one of the our our focus it model that is holistic nested edge detector. This edge detector used BSDS, and this is the, the model most used to applications in different fields. And then what we saw here is that the the architecture, the architecture of this <clears throat> the architecture of this hedge model has four stage, and in every stage, as is this is not a, a fully connected layer. So this lose some special characteristic of edge detection. Thinking about this, we have start preparing a new data set first. And this is uh, the, the new data set. So uh, we spent with my team, we spent uh, many times to <clears throat> to label to label to supervise and to evaluate and validate. Uh, many times the the edge maps and as you see this is our last uh, task that was uh, that were presented in the 2020s later uh, we improved improved uh, this work <coughs> improved this uh, this work for the 2023 and using this data set Using this data set, we, we can show you how Dixinet works comparing with the most known models. And so this BSDS is not used in the training of the Dixinet, we can see most edges are detected than in the other model that used this data set. So uh, right now, right there, we see that we are going for, we are going in the right path, but uh, we needed to see a little deep, deeper. We needed to see how we can generally say this kind of data, because in, in deep learning, a model is learned with a data set with some characteristic. But if you are going to use, for example, in in different areas, like in in the medical imaging, or you can use in in agriculture or oceanography or in different different situations, those images are not the same as the data set used for the training. So <clears throat> that is why we we lastly in, in the summer have prepared another data set to evaluate the generalization process of the edge detection. 
So what we do in this is that we prepare this unified image for edge detection data set, uh, taking images from different data set, collecting images from different data set, manually labeling this part and evaluate if a model, an edge detector, is capable of, uh, of generalizing in the different is capable of general lace in the different areas of the of the in the different fields you are working on. So uh, this unified image from edge detection have been taken one or two images have been taken from the BPEG data set, BSDS, New York University data set, Pascal context, and, and so on. And we have presented in the last year two new edge detectors. As you can see, PDNet was the, the, the smallest one, as you can remember here. It's the smallest one in the state of the art. But in the last year, uh, we have represented this new data set, uh, sorry, this new edge detector that uh, can see in the 2020, the LDC model that we presented has a, a little less than parameters than the PDNet. But in this year, we have improved further. And we can see that just 58K parameters are needed. It's a huge difference. So uh, let's see what kind of result it gives. Here is, uh, here is the result of TED, for example. We can see that this is the image from BSDS, and this is the image from the PDNet. And here we, we share also the, the, the results from the ether that has around five, <clears throat> 500 million of parameters. So as we can see, our TED presents more edges than the other counterpart, than the counterparts. So this TED network is our <clears throat> our last presentation, and as you can see, it just have four blocks with two convolutional layers, and it can run in a in a simple edge computer. And uh, additionally, we can say that this is uh, this is a, the most the most light edge detector you can you can find right now in in the community. So. Yeah, this is the comparison, for example. <clears throat> for example, Dixinet is trained with, with 11 epochs, and it has around 35 million of parameters, and it needs 20 hours to train. And in a computer as my laptop, it needs around uh, 0 0.34 trains per second per image. And PDNet, as you can see here, uh, is trained in 20 epochs. It just have, it just have 60, uh, 610k parameters, but it needs 53 hours of training. And if we compare with our TED, you can even you can you can you can try just with six epochs and 55k parameters and in 31 minutes this is a huge difference of training that um, most of the people don't don't see the advantage because uh, when you need to generate edge map most of in most of the time in most of the time you what you need is use your proper images train it and evaluate in your tasks so um, so this is this is the the efficiency of our edge detector that you can use it uh, right now for free. It's you can you can use it. It's, it's in the internet for free. <clears throat> and as you can see, this is a good uh, good thing. But as uh, previously I told you, is that we need to evaluate how our edge maps is working in the downstream tasks. Because if we evaluate in just a one data set, maybe the edge map that you are using in your works has not the same pattern, or same characteristics as our data set. So that is why we use it a downstream task to evaluate how our P 
PDNet improve or help in the downstream task. For example, I, we we use it in the sketch image retrieval. And you can say, for example, the BSDS train it with the most used data set with the, B, uh, with the BSDS. It just has the result of top one, 0 0.39. So, but if we see that train it with PDNet, our data set, data set, it reads 0 0.52. So this is a huge difference. And here is, we see the, the model. on you know, this uh, that those models that has more parameters and are mostly used so um, this uh, so this task helps us to give us more support to what we are doing and the, our future work also and and as I showed you previously, we can see here the qualitative result of our edge detector. <clears throat> and now we are going to see the part that I showed you because edge detection is not the last task because the edge maps are used the task where you are working on. So most of the models, or most of the people trying to validate their the work using different downstream tasks like uh, semantic segmentation, classification, some of the medical image processing, even, even super resolution or image enhancement. However, here is, here is we should uh, take into account that Edge detection is not the same as contour detection or boundary detection. And if we use edge detection for semantic segmentation or segmentation, maybe we cannot improve the results or, or the work that I were working without edge detection. So that is uh, why first of using edge detection, I have to understand, I have to see the real characteristic of edge detection, because if I don't use it properly, maybe we cannot improve the, the previous result without edge maps. So generally, the, I think this is our future world. I think edge detection will improve the world in sketching and retrieval enhancement, uh, some of the medical image processing, super resolution, and so on. So how normally the world of people use edge detections in their tasks, I mean edge maps in their tasks. Normally, this is the, the learning model. You have the input data, you have the learning model, and you have the results. But in most of the tasks, like, like when we have a model, uh, image-based based model, and we need to improve using edge detection. So we have a model termed domain adaptation that come that that take as an input an edge map, and then this domain ad adaptation fits the different level of the CNN models. For example, this is one of the 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 way you can you can work with the edge detection and and other downstream tasks. And another way to use edge detection that I have seen in the community is that in in this in, in the in the breast cancer detection, for example. So here we have the, the thermal image, and this thermal image before fit the, the deep learning model is is uh, used to detect the, the edge maps from this image. So this image, for example, using the, the Petit Edge Detector and Robert Edge Detector, 
three images, like we can see here, three images are fused or concatenated to fit the main data, uh, the main model. And then we can uh, reach or we can have our results, our classification results. For example, if we are speaking about the, the breast cancer uh, cancer detection, with just images, the output can be that the, that the image is infected or not infected. So uh, this is this is how uh, the this is how people, the community, use edge maps in their downstream tasks. One with the input of the edge maps together with the, the base image, and the other using domain adaptation and feeding the, the deeper layer, the shallower layer. And that's it. Uh, this is my mail. If you want to speak with me or maybe we can uh, collaborate in any work and you, need, you have some of the questions of our works, I will be happy to answer you. And no questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Sarah. That was very, very interesting. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Oh, great. Feel free to type it out. I can always read it out on your behalf as well. Okay, let me let me. This is the first time I'm using this this meeting. Oh, <laughs> I, I, see. Uh -huh. I don't know how to <laughs> how to use it. Mainly, I have used it Zoom, but sorry. Okay. And we did have a message from Maria. She said she has visited Ecuador before and she loved it. So just wanted to give a okay. shout out there. Yeah. So okay. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. I'm really happy when you visit in the future. <laughs> I have a question. Um, sorry, you may have said this or mentioned this, but I, I guess I didn't. So my name is Maria Esteva and I work at the Texas Advanced Computing Center. I listen to you talk about GPUs. And we have these supercomputers that will probably benefit your work so much. But my question is, where do you have your your tool or your software available as open source that people can uh, use it, reuse it? Do you have a citation for it? Uh, it's a great question. And most of my words are open source. Okay. And maybe you can access to the citation I have put over here, and okay. I, I leave this QR. And you can you can have this presentation, oh. and then you can visit. Or you can follow me. Uh, this is my this is my uh, personal web page and my my ex. I don't know how I, if I have to say X or Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so you can follow me. But all of my researches and even the researches research I have presented at a freely available even the source code in GitHub. But and the you don't have also. a citation. That people can okay. cite you, I guess. Oh yeah, uh, maybe we can we can just see our last okay. presentation. That is that is that is that. Sorry. Mm. <clears throat> a citation with a digital object identifier. I mean. Oh yeah 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 yeah. Maybe okay. yeah. Okay. Sorry sorry sorry. Well well maybe I am. Um, I maybe I I I participate in this repository mostly. Uh huh. So, so um, and here we have our. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I yeah. see. I just want these to be, um, you know, clear so that the students can uh, be able to get any of your research uh, products and cite you accordingly. Okay. So, so thank you. So, so uh, I think they can use it and. And uh, it's straightforward. And as, as I say, this is the most light model. Mm -hmm. So maybe this can run in your laptop. I see. Um, yeah. What is this TED? TEED is a is a repository, or it is the name of? 
Okay, T TDE is a tiny and efficient oh, model okay. for a simulation. It's, it's just a, a name of the, the model. Okay, but it's a repository for the model. Is the GitHub space for that model where you are developing? Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There's another question. Rohan has another question. I, I will mute myself. Okay. Uh, good evening to you. It's a very nice presentation. My short, uh, I mean, it's not a question, just a query. I mean, if my object size is just one pixel value, okay, so, I mean, it's very tiny. So, will this model uh, will able to still detect the edges or if my object is in a camouflage condition, so will this model will be still working? If not, or if yes, so if not, uh, what is the kind of low level processing should I take into consideration to make it happen actually? Wow, this is a great question. Uh, but first of all, if you have an small images like uh, like targets that has target that has just one or two pixels, uh, this model is capable of detect as just uh, just some artifacts but it can detect but maybe we cannot we cannot uh, we cannot classify as uh, as any target data so so maybe we so what we can do when we have this problem is use new data of this character with these characteristics and try again mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. maybe we can we can do fine tuning or transfer learning Mm -hmm. And whenever we we use our sample data, the the model will be capable of do what you want. Right, right, right. And uh, uh, professor, another short question is that I mean, uh, did you in your approach try to uh, for the bigger models actually? Did you tried any approach of pruning actually? Because pruning is one of the methodologies which can help to reduce down the model size drastically that can be placed in the uh, edge devices. Did you try to do, try for it? Yeah, yeah, this is a good advice because uh, I have read some of the words from the doctor, I don't remember the name, it's, it's the professor in the, MIT, in the MIT. They have presented quantization even and pruning. So honestly, I have not used it yet, but I am considering it to, to reduce this work because as you can see here um, in this presentation, this one, as you can see in this presentation, for example, Kani mm -hmm. uh, evaluated in, the, in a laptop computer, for example, it has 392 frames per second. It's super fast, mm -hmm. but it cannot uh, detect uh, uh, hard edges. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what we do is the next step is is using this kind of uh, this kind of methods to reduce the computational cost. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you to you. Um, I'll pose a question. So, I'm I was happy to see when you mentioned that edge detection can be used as a pre-step for um, super resolution, which is, you know, pretty much some of the applications, the downstream tasks, right, that can be applied or, you know, that can benefit from image detection, I mean, edge detection. I wanted to ask, uh, particularly, how, in your opinion, would you correlate the two, especially given that these are your, you know, research areas or focus areas? How do you correlate edge detection with the super resolution? If you could elaborate on that. Yeah. Well, it's um, uh, I'm I'm collaborating right now with a with a friend who is working in the edge detection of thermal super resolution images, and we are trying to give a more edge characteristic to those results because. <clears throat> Thermal images are a little di are a little different, so um, there is not much research in this area using edge maps for super resolution and thermal images. But what generally a couple of papers do is 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 making the domain adaptation. This domain adaptation, I think, is the key 
is the key work we should do to improve the super resolution, at least in the in the thermal images, in the um, visible images, the images we know, the RGB images. I have not used it, and I cannot. I'm afraid I cannot um, give a, a wise advice. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I will look forward to what will come out of that. You know, um, and then my other question was about the evaluation. Um, this model was trained on existing, right? Uh, existing data. So what, what if we have, and this could also probably relate to Rohan's question, but what if we have completely unseen data? How would you evaluate or validate your model? Sorry, which kind of data if, did you say? If, uh, is this model, um, I don't know if I got it correctly, but was it trained on um, existing, an existing data set where it has, that has had a lot of models trained on, right? Is that the, is that the case yeah. here? So given a point that I have an image or data that is completely unseen before, how would you evaluate your edge detection model? Wow, that is that is a, a super hard problem because we, we recently are approaching with this with this problem because the most important thing for edge detection is that is that these edge detectors have should be capable of uh, predict any kind of images, a uh, gray scale, even, even infrared images. And right now, many of our followers are using an infrared images or thermal images, but they are evaluating their model in the downstream task. If they are using for, I don't know, craft detection, they are evaluating that. But the model that they are using to, to extract the edge were trained with another data set. So, uh, first, firstly, in the 2020s, we just evaluated in our proper data set. So, right now, we are starting to evaluate in as many downstream tasks as possible, because at the end, the SMAP are for those tasks and not for the edge detection data set, because the edge detection data set is, yes, it's good, but it's just for the visualization. But in the real world, we need to improve with this detection and other tasks. So personally, uh, personally, I think we should integrate, we should integrate a data set that contains different domain of the images and with, I don't know, may, many, many different images. For example, this data set just have 30 images. Maybe maybe we need to augment the images with uh, infrared, I don't know, grayscale, more thermal images, uh, and so on, and evaluate just one data set. Maybe that, that kind of results will give us a better understanding of the generalization process of the edge detector. Thank you. That sounds wonderful. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, Christopher. Yeah. I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that both Landsat 8 and Landsat 9 are acquiring in the thermal infrared um, at nominally 100 meter resolution. Um, Resampled to 30 meter to meet the multi spectral data on the, the same sensors. Um, and, and VIRS has been a great step forward uh, for global uh, imaging um, with 375 meter data at Nader. Um, so there, there is a whole lot more infrared data out there than there used to be. And some of it is very high quality. Yeah, they are. Uh, I, I mean, we have a lot of data and many data sets from different uh, wavelet spectrum are freely available to use it. The thing is that we have to annotate manually that, uh, that data. And this is a little challenging even for us because maybe 
with my eyes, I can see it there, and many another people cannot say that that is an image. That that could be a little problem. But as I said, we are going to start searching more kind of that data or perform a augmentation process. Maybe we just need to discover new kind of augmentations to train it and. Who knows, maybe we can improve the generalization. Uh, personally, I think the most important thing right now is using a deep learning edge detector for any kind of image. And this ha this have to be maybe uh, a generalization model for edge detection. Maybe this can improve even the, the worst in, in any area that this is used. Very good. I I can I can attest that uh, the presence of even thin clouds makes the satellite infrared data challenging to use. Um, so image stacking um, is one of the ways that has been used to improve work, uh, improve results in the areas where I work, which is the cryosphere. So thank you. Yes. Hi, Dr. Soria. Good to see you here. I have a question for you and also thank you so much for your informative presentation for all of us. And my question is that in one of your slides, you when you compare different models, you use F1 score as a metric. I wonder, do you use other metrics for comparing different models? to each other or for your uh, generated models, which kind of metrics do you use to evaluate your models? Wow. Well, um, generally, in the dissertation domain, the BSD, uh, the ODS and OIS is the metrics most used widely. But lastly, from the 19, uh, 2019, sorry, 2019, um, people are using even a uh, mean square error and big signal to noise ratio. And in our future presentation, we are going to use those kind of data to evaluate the thickness of this edge detector also. And one, and another task I am starting, we are just starting to use is this kind of, uh, the downstream tasks, evaluate in the downstream tasks. Um, and that's it. Uh, I think the most used one till now is the ODS and OIS. But uh, lastly, uh, some of the some of the papers also use a mean square error and and the big signal to noise ratio. Okay. Thank you so much for your clarification. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Soria. It was a wonderful presentation, extremely insightful. I saw some comments as well, applauding you for that, for the great work that you're doing. Um, Thank you again, and thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us and for sharing. We look forward to posting this on our website and for all other people to also get a chance to see the great work that you're doing. Thank you. Great, thank you for your invitation also. And uh, I, I am very, very happy saying the work what you are doing in the iHeart Institute. Mm -hmm. And if I can collaborate with it, please just call me. <laughs> And guys, thank you for your time. And this is amazing. Mm -hmm. And have you, have you see you again? <laughs> Absolutely. We appreciate it. Thank Bye. you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye, Bye to everyone. Nice to meet you. Bye. Nice to meet you too. Bye-bye.